All right, let's get started. Well, wanted to uh, thank you everyone who's uh, attending today's webinar on backup and disaster recovery. Uh, my name is Brad Feeks. I'm with the Estes Group. Uh, today I am joined by Chris Coppler uh, with the Estes Group. He is our uh, Director of Technical Sales and uh, General Guru on all things related to uh, managed IT services, including backup and disaster recovery. So uh, welcome to you, Chris, and looking forward to working on, uh, on this session with you today. Um, so our session, Glad to be here. Yeah, you bet. So our session is going to be pretty free format today. I got some slides to talk through, and Chris and I will have some banter on, on various elements of the discussion. Uh, what we're trying to do here with this series is try to give some, some stories of other customers that have gone through various elements of digital transformation and try to understand, you know, from a customer perspective, what that, what that felt like to them. We find that um, we can bury someone with a lot of tech technical terminology and such, or we can try to give you some ideas of what the, what the actual narratives look like for, for companies that are in the middle of, of various uh, transformations, technically speaking. So we'll be doing some of that today. Um, Daryl, uh, Chris and I will be having some conversation and uh, you are more than open uh, to uh, raise your hand at any point and uh, levy any questions to us and we'll be uh, more than welcome to talk through that. So, as I had mentioned, downtime, like anything else, it's always a story. And uh, too often, I know we're well away from Halloween, but quite often it's a horror story. Um, when I talk with customers, I see quite often, you know, I, I'm a fan of clip art. You might have noticed the idea of your server going nuclear is, is not an uncommon uh, subject matter to a lot of customers. Um, and it's a, you know, there's a litany of things that are, are happening out in the, in the world right now that makes uh, backup and disaster recovery an important topic because of the challenges that are out there. When we talk about sim simple things like, like natural disasters, or we talk about technical things like a hacker uh, messing with data or a ransomware uh, application actually taking control of a, a major device. Uh, we talk about server attrition and, and just general, you know, old fashioned server crashing and having situations where you need to find a way to get that information back, but you can't do it on your existing uh, technical platform. Uh, we have, you know, data corruption due to various reasons and end user errors at times that could lead to uh, some form of malware or simply uh, data getting updated incorrectly or corrupted and the need to roll back to uh, old environments or old data. Um, and I think that's probably the, one of the themes coming out of this is the idea of data and environment, right? Sometimes you're in the need where you need to roll back and, and recapture some lost data. Other times, the thing that you're trying to uh, recover from is something that is much more broader in scope than just mere data and is affecting your whole uh, servo ec server ecosystem. And we'll be talking about both of those today. So what are some of the determinants of digital downtime that we would want to consider um, that, that affect us in our normal lives? And I've uh, often heard the term, the idea is that the problems are hidden in plain sight and uh, they're broad and they're quite often, you know, as many devices or connection points as you have inside of a network, each of those is a potential risk point. Um, and this, these are as simple as things like email. Uh, email continues to be one of the number one or the number one causes of, of interactions with ransomware, malware, et cetera. Uh, see customers all over the place trying to tighten up their email policies, their spam filters, but also their behavioral tendencies of their end users to get them wisened to these attacks that are often becoming more and more acute. Um, of course, the internet. Right, we call it infiltration dressed as information. It's it's always a risk out there as a as a means of compromising your your broader network. Uh, for me, the idea of integrated applications, I'm always my head always goes to the idea of, of hybrid clouds and the idea of your ERP application as the hub of your organization with this set of spokes revolving around it, and those are all these third party uh, applications and integrations. The problem, of course, is Every integration could potentially be another point of failure, another point uh, that of uh, infiltration. So this always creates as many problems as it does uh, solve you know, problems that it solves. 
you have your classic problems of authentication. And I see this still with, with basic customers that have uh, password and usernames as administrator, administrator, manager, manager, um, simple blocking and tackling challenges with authentication that creates all kinds of, of simple things that should be avoided. But nevertheless, you know, if someone is able to discern those credentials, they could create all kinds of harm and do it under the auspices of an official user. Uh, another area where I see here is the, uh, the uh, Internet of Things movements. So we all talk about the greatness of, of connectivity. And in my little icon there, you have the idea of a smart parking meter, right? Um, the challenge, of course, is that everything that is connected is a potential failure point, right? Whoever thought the idea that you could get hacked from your fridge, um, that has become a reality in, in our world. So the idea of connectivity increases the number of targets that are always there. This sort of overlaps with the BYOD movement because now you have a set of devices that are, are increasingly connectable to a broader network, but they are not necessarily company managed. Um, I think certainly we talk about the pandemic a lot lately in, in terms of security. And you talk about end users who have you know, personal devices now connecting to the network in one of many ways. And the policies that govern those devices are, are probably much looser than you would like them to be. And that creates risk, of course. And the idea with COVID, and I've seen this uh, extensively with customers in an increasingly remote world now or connecting through VPNs or connecting through other ways to try to get in and access their environment in a distributed workforce. And the distributed workforce creates a lot of benefit, but it also creates the potential for uh, compromised environments. That said, uh, let's talk a little bit about the terminology that we'll be throwing around today a little bit. And I'm going to jump right down to the, the question I had at the bottom, because I hear a lot of, uh, it's mentioned many times where someone will say, well, what's the difference between backup and disaster recovery? Is this one term or are these two terms? And so, Chris, why don't you tell me a little bit, you know more about this than me, tell me a little <laughs> bit about the differences between backup and, and DRAS. Yeah, so so backup and DRAS is um, people a lot of times, I think sometimes, sometimes mistakenly use them interchangeably, um, but they're really a solution that kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, the simplest description I like to throw out there is um, disaster recovery is kind of the heavy hitter in the backup solution. Um, and it's really a good analogy is it's Batman and Robin. Um, both of them can fight crime and security threats um, individually, but if you put them together, it's usually a better duo with team and you're, you're more secure on that front. So a backup um, can keep you safe from ransomware threats. Um, it's really a snapshot in time um, and you can kind of in a backup solution change um, pretty much what your recovery point objectives are. A lot of people do several hours. They'll do a backup every hour, every 30 minutes, maybe do four hour snapshots and then a daily backup. A DRAS solution is more of a real time replication of data to an alternate location. Um, that's a much more robust solution. Um, it's much better at combating ransomware because it's not just here's a couple of checkpoints. It's basically doing real time replication of that environment. Um, so it's a disaster recovery is a more inclusive solution and gives you more restore points, but it's a, generally a much shorter um, overall window. So usually in disaster recovery solutions, they'll do 72 hour snapshots of the, the constant changes of data. Backup solutions are usually you'll have periodic snap points. Um, you'll maybe do like a month retention. And if you have compliancy, you can go Here's monthly, yearly backups all the way back to seven years. So DRAS is more of a real-time solution. Um, backup is more of a snapshot in time. Nice. So if you have a situation where you realize you've been compromised, but the compromise came maybe a month ago, then you might be relying on your backups versus your disaster recovery. I see that a fair number of times right. where the infiltration and the actual discovery of the infiltration is a pretty nice time zone between those. Yep, that's very, very accurate. Um, and so it depends on when you were hit um, and it's vice versa. If you got, if something came in in the last 72 hours, it might have hit uh, your production as well as your four hour snapshots to where those are no good. But a DRAS solution, because it's backing up the data consistently, you're probably going, I mean, it's hundreds of rollback points. You're going to be able to find one that you can restore from. Very good. All right. So on that point, uh, Chris was mentioning 
uh, RPO and RTO. Let's talk about those just a little bit here. And so the idea of an RPO then, this net normally has to do with kind of the data that you're willing to lose, right? Um, how much and what frequency of that backup occurs, that snapshot that Chris was talking about. And the idea would be, you know, how much uh, data are you willing to lose um, in doing one of these uh, recoveries? And I actually have a, a use case uh, further on where we talk a little bit about that, that in practice. Um, recovery time objective or RTO, this has to do more with how much downtime can you uh, abide with as a business? Is this something where you know you need to have something immediately able to roll over, or can you handle a, a larger period of downtime where you don't have server access? And that becomes one of those kind of key uh, decision points when you're looking to understand just what kind of solution you need. Now, Chris, what when you see customers working through uh, RPO and RTO, what kind of considerations do you see them using? Um, one of the big ones that comes up is total hours of operation. If you are a, uh, a 24 by seven um, business, you know, manufacturing distribution, a lot of times um, your, your RTO is going to be much, much lower um, because you're operating 24 hours a day. So you don't really have those natural breaks where um, say there's a maintenance window or everyone's at home where you have an opportunity to do that recovery of that data. Um, so those solutions or those businesses much better align with solutions that are DRAS focused um, because they don't really have a window um, to kind of have that downtime. If you're a business that's primarily, um, you know, eight to five or uh, say eight to eight to six, nine to six, um, and maybe one weekend day um, on the weekends, a backup solution might be the most viable for you because it's going to be a little bit more cost effective. Um, and you have those natural breaks where you can restore some of that data. Okay, so there's some cost considerations there as well. That's good. I imagine I've seen in, in some of my customers cases where uh, a customer has kind of what you said there, where they have uh, frequent periods of, of potential downtime in terms of evenings or weekends, and then they do something like implement an e-commerce system. And now suddenly that, that uh, latency or those periods are kind of gone because you, there are periods that, that they can still be down in terms of production. But in terms of taking orders, they are taking orders now 24-7. And that challenge, that change to their business model uh, changes their needs, I find, in terms of uh, backup and dress. That can absolutely happen. Um, it can absolutely happen. And there is, there, there's both, both solutions do have a cost associated with them. Um, backup is usually the cheaper option. Um, a true dress solution um, can vary. Uh, those costs can sometimes be expensive. Um, especially when deploying a, a disaster recovery solution for an on-prem environment. Um, it can be quite pricely if you add up those costs because really what you're doing is you're taking your environment and you're replicating that on-prem environment to say, as soon as these resources go down, here's the time frame that it takes to basically have everything spun back up. So you're basically having a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, when you start looking at cl uh, cloud disaster recovery solutions, um, it becomes a little bit more of an affordable solution because those solutions don't necessarily rely on having a one-to-one -one resource um, allocation. Very good. So when I think about backup and disaster recovery, I think of this as coming in a couple of different flavors um, because I see customers doing different things when they're approaching this. And Chris, you can pipe in too with what you've seen because I've seen kind of four core ways in which backup and disaster recovery can be become part of a, a customer's solution. Now I see there are still in manufacturing distribution a fair number of customers that are living almost exclusively on premise and they're starting to kick the tires on cloud. There's some suspicion and some questions about latency and recoverability and access and security, of course. Um, they see sometimes dress as a nice uh, option as to kind of dip your toe in the pool of the cloud and just reach out and say, okay, let's, let's try to uh, start off with a cloud backup or a, a cloud DRAS solution as part of our, our mission or our transformation into more of a, a cloud-based uh, business. Um, for customers that are using kind of a, a standalone solution for their on-premise uh, server environments, I see that also as a case there where I'll have a uh, on-premise uh, server, but I want to make sure that I have backups and I don't want them on premise. And we'll talk more about that. But then the cloud then sometimes is a nice uh, way of parlaying that to say uh, core environment on premise, backups in the cloud. 
Um, what we uh, also see is uh, we offer a thing called server care, where we do kind of a full care package for a given server environment. And, and there I see it often uh, bundled as part of that, right? So you have full control of all the inputs and outputs on that server. And one of those pieces then becomes the, the backup or the DRAS solution. And then finally, you know, as a hosting customer that hosts uh, customers ERPs, we find that bundling uh, backup or DRAS as part of that overall uh, service bundle uh, seems to be a very common piece of that. Where do you see, uh, you know, backup and disaster recovery with our customers, uh, Chris? Any any feedback there on that, yeah. on that combination? So, so you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, the most robust backup and disaster recovery solution will have a pretty much they'll have your production environment um, if it's on site. You'll have a backup locally on site as well because it's the fastest data recovery um, stand, from a standpoint of if you're on prem. Um, you can recover those backups or do a recovery, um, and it's from usually another device, another server. Sometimes you can have a just a uh, device sitting on the network, uh, NAS storage device that you can restore that data from. It's going to be the fastest for on-prem because you don't have to go over an internet connection. Um, then when you see uh, kind of enterprises or some of our customers will then move to the next step to where they'll have backups also stored in cloud um, because you don't want your backups sitting in one place. Um, if you are a multi-site location um, and your primary site hosts your application, if you have a fire in the building burns down and all of your backups are on site, um, yes, you are taking backups, but it's not really protecting your organization. So a lot of organizations will do, if that are on site, will do a replication on site, then they take that backup replication off site. Um, so that way they still have a copy of their data. Um, and then really that final step is disaster recovery solution because most of our customers, um, if they are still on-prem, don't have the type of environments where they have a one-to-one -one ratio. So their production environment does not mirror, they can have an entire, that same exact environment sitting ready to go hot swappable. A lot of organizations due to cost aren't set up to do that. So they, you are right. Most of them have started looking at a disaster recovery solution um, to where they can replicate that data offsite. So worst case scenario, um, they can continue functioning as an organization and spend those resources up in the cloud. Mm, yeah, I think that idea of the combination of on-premise and off-premise backups is a real nice thing to understand there, that kind of belt and suspenders approach of keeping your RTOs real tight understanding that if that gets compromised, you kind of have belt and suspenders and can reach out to the cloud for it if needed. That's a good idea. Also, we'll run into a situation here where the local backup storage really wasn't an option because the server itself had just died and we actually had to change the, uh, the, the redeployment of the server. Actually, we had to jump to the cloud as a function of that. And we'll, we'll hit one of those uh, one of those talking points here. So now I want to talk through a couple of case studies or use cases of you know, different customers and kind of get, get an idea of their story of uh, how backup and disaster recovery um, not necessarily helped them because some of these cases are kind of uh, cautionary tales where customers didn't have the necessary uh, tools and, and solutions in place to help their organization and then felt the pain as a result. Um, so this was one case that I, I call them the eyes off the prize uh, uh, customer. They were an East Coast manufacturer. They, the reason their eyes were off the prize is that they were on the brink of an ERP implementation. So they were on uh, probably a two year long project to get this ERP system up and running. So they were literally on the brink. They were, they were counting down the cut over weekend. Um, they had an on-premise ecosystem. So their, their enterprise systems plus all of their backups were all part of their on-premise stack. Um, and as I had said, you real, all attention was focused on cutover weekend uh, from the entire organization. Uh, unfortunately, this was one of those perfect storm situations where a ransomware attack occurred that very weekend. Um, as, as their provider, from a consulting standpoint, their entire customer, the entire customer went dark on us. And we were looking to try to find emails. And, and we started eventually, the, the customer started emailing us through their Gmail accounts or their Hotmail accounts. And we realized just what had happened, the, the entire system had been brought down, email servers, the everything included. Um, really the, the, the net result of this situation was it was a full year 
before they were able to get the system cleaned up and stabilized. Uh, they did not opt to pay the ransom, so they tried to go from some of their own backups. Unfortunately, their backups were not recent uh, because some of them had been corrupted. So we ended up in this regard, you know, doing a lot of build from scratch or a kind of piece back together. It was kind of a Humpty Dumpty case where you really learned kind of that lesson of uh, an on-premise solution. It really increases your risk. Um, your major major projects, you know, you you can't uh, compromise your security concerns either. You need to make sure that you have uh, you know sufficient staff and resources that um, just because you're doing a major implementation and cutting over that your other resources aren't still watching the you know the dials to make sure that you're not finding yourself compromised. So this customer. I call them so nice, let's, let's do it twice. Um, they had kind of two unique and separate uh, disasters that they had to recover from. And uh, they made for an interesting story because of that. So uh, we came into contact with them when they moved their ERP system into our private cloud. And we were managing their private cloud while the rest of their network footing, including their footprint, including their backups, those were all still on premise. Um, they encountered a first disaster. It was a ransomware attack. It was one of those that brought the business to its knees. And because their backups were all on premise, everything was infected. So the whole system was brought down. So they learned kind of a pay, uh, painful lesson uh, from that. And that was that they needed one to uh, boost their endpoint protection, but also they needed to move those backups off site. And they ended up moving them into the cloud as a means of correcting that situation that should they have that come up again, they'd be able to fall back to some, to, uh, some offsite backups. Um, then they had a second disaster and this was a different kind of disaster. This was more where they, they had an aging server and it uh, unexpectedly melted down. All right, so this was uh, after their first uh, situation. So they had now some offsite backups that were available to them and they had, were able to fail over to a cloud image. So this was a case where they couldn't just uh, take, a, take the image and put it back on top of the server because the server itself was now a steaming pile. So they had to fail over to the cloud and uh, within 15 minutes, they were back in business. And so this was from, you know, from a lesson learned standpoint, uh, they had had a server crash you know, five or 10 years before, and it had been a week long endeavor to get the data back and installed on a new server. And so the idea for them, it was a, a real tangible uh, understanding that you can change a, a week long process to a 15 minute process with the right tools in place. Now, this is the customer I call the shrug off uh, customer. I, I had dinner with them once and was just uh, uh, just dumbfounded, honestly, at the, the level of nonchalance that they had towards their uh, backup and disaster recovery, but it worked for them uh, to their own admittance. They had an on-premise architecture, right? So they had well-tested offsite backups. I think that's a real important point that we'll get to about testing, the, the making sure that you're testing your backup and disaster recovery strategy. And they had done that. And uh, so we were sitting and talking about things at dinner and he says to me, oh yeah, we've been ransomed twice this year. And he said it with such ease and panache that I was kind of taken aback. And I said, well, what do you do when, when this happened? And he said, oh yeah, we, we just rolled back to the previous day. And it was for them, it was, it was business as usual. It was, they'd lose that day's worth of transaction, but of course they avoid the ransomware payment. And they also, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, avoid that uh, discontinuity that comes from such an event. Uh, so really for me, uh, though I, I, I do kind of question, you know, the, the cost of having to catch up an entire day several times a year, and you have to wonder about uh, what's, what kind of protection they have on their network's edge. I think there was a real interesting lesson for me. It's, it's one of those uh, report, restore point objective uh, questions is how much you know, data loss is acceptable for your organization when you're setting up your, act, your backups. You got to really understand for your, your RPO, can you live with that day off? Is that, is that okay? Can you catch all that information up? And does that work for your organization? Uh, for some companies, I think that would be a crippling uh, amount of time to try and shrug off. And for, for, this, for this customer, it wasn't which is probably a, a good way of underscoring that for every customer, the proper solution, the appropriately priced and tailored solution for them is not necessarily a one size fits all. 
All right, one last, and this was kind of an interesting, this is more from a, a technical standpoint that's, that's interesting uh, to note because this was a, a third party solution integrator. Uh, they themselves had a private cloud they own some hardware and they co-located it in a local data center. Um, similarly, they had a, a solid backup uh, and disaster recovery solution that was deployed to that same co-located ecosystem. Um, and the interesting thing here was that the backup environment and the primary you know, production environment, they shamed this, shared the same domain controller. And so the, the ransomware attack that attacked their primary environment was able to penetrate their backups through the domain controller because it was shared. It was able basically to hop over the, the wall and infect both of them, both of the environments. So they ended up having to pay the ransom and basically re-implement uh, from their uh, restored backups uh, after the hackers had, had given that back. Um, so I think the, the lesson learned there was, you know, a lot of ways uh, these folks had done a lot of, you know, logical things. When you own hardware, you really want to stick it in a colo versus trying to manage that on premise. And there's a lot of reasons you'd want to put that in a, in a data center versus trying to maintain all of that infrastructure on site. And the problem was, of course, was that simple decision to have a, a, a single DC connecting uh, both of those environments and creating that, that hole. So from here, um, Chris, and you can jump in here, some lessons learned. So when I want to go back with some of these customers of what, what some of the things that they came up from this, I think one clear piece was that idea of separation of concerns, right? So that your backups and your primary environments, they shouldn't be located, uh, you know, virtually or physically in, in the same place. You need some really good barriers between them to prevent that cross-contamination that's very common. And as I, I just mentioned, the, the domain controller is one of those classic options there. Um, it's really common, I think, with, with customers with on-site uh, backups to find that, that challenge facing them. Um, we talked a little bit about RPO and RTO already, about some of those pieces there that, that end up being and a critical pieces for your business to understand is this in what's in your budget uh, and what are your, your business continuity requirements and how are you going to blend those together? Um, and really for, for some of these cases, you, you talk about backup and disaster recovery and really it's, you know, backups like a backstop, right? It's that thing that helps you in, if everything else fails, you can always go back to your backup. Um, that doesn't really necessarily mean that you should be avoiding those more proactive uh, means of, uh, protecting your business and I think about uh, penetration testing, endpoint security, uh, you know, user training. There are a whole bunch of things to try to prevent the problem at the source versus having to fall back and uh, accept the loss of a day or what have you. Uh, what are some other things you've found, Chris, in terms of uh, the lessons learned that, that customers might benefit from in these areas? Yeah, so so one of the things I think when people are looking at how much does a solution cost for that peace of mind, a lot of businesses look at backup and disaster recovery um, a lot in the same way that a lot of people look at health insurance. It's expensive. They don't want to pay for it. It's you know they've never they've never been to the ER. They've never had critical open heart surgery. Um, so it, it's it let's let's worry about that if it happens, but it hasn't happened to us. Knock on wood. Um, so that seems to be a common methodology out there in the business world. And, and they, they, they say, well, if we get ransomware, we'll just pay the ransomware and then we'll be on our way. Um, a better way to look at it from a cost perspective is not only how much downtime from a ransomware perspective of paying that to get back up. Um, what is the implementation time to restore? Um, that's not usually an instant process unless you have a backup or disaster recovery solution in place. And then the, the hidden cost that nobody ever thinks about from a business perspective is what do you do with overhead for your company? How many employees do you pay on staff? Do you let all your employees go home? Do you have to pay all those salary costs where you lose not only an entire day's worth of basically costs for the company um, that would be happening regardless, but then you're also losing an entire day's worth of revenue. So it is a lot more costly than just paying a ransomware and restoring if that's the methodology that you're going to go with. There's a lot more costs that all add up to make it a very expensive option um, if you don't have that insurance policy in place, such as backup or disaster recovery. So I think that that's a, it's kind of a mind shift that the business world is starting to see 
Um, and one of the easiest ways is, uh, is to protect your business is really looking at the disaster recovery solution um, and making sure that it's deployed with air gaps technology. So air gap is really a, uh, a definition or phrase that came um, back in the day when people used to do backups on tape, they would click a button, back it up on the tape. And then usually somebody from the office would physically drive that tape to another location, put it in the owner's safe, put it in the office manager's safe, and you had an air distance between the two data sets. Um, in a true disaster recovery solution, you want to have an air gapped methodology, which is not only are they doing a disaster recovery where they're taking their, those data points, they're making sure that those data points are not accessible as files are internet accessible. So they can be restored to, but if somebody gets into a disaster recovery environment, they physically don't have any way to, or virtually to edit that data because it is not bootable data um, in a air gap disaster recovery solution. Mm, nice. I like that idea of air gap. I was at a customer site uh, the other week and I had, uh, they were coming to a, a modern ERP system from an AS400 based system. And one of their IT guys poked his head in the door and he had a big stack of tapes. He said, Oh, I got to go gotta <laughs> provide an air gap. And he was off to another site doing, doing just that. And I got a question come in here about testing. It says, you, you talked about well-tested backups. What does it mean to be well-tested and how do companies verify that their backups are feasible? So, yeah. Uh, uh, so with that's that's the other critical piece, especially with the backup solution is um, you can do testing on both. You can do testing on a backup solution and, a, and then testing it on a disaster recovery solution as well. They are separate tests on a backup solution. You need to make sure that the image is not corrupted, that the data is bootable. And basically the server can boot um, to the OS level to make sure that that backup is valid. There are a ton of different backup solutions and systems out there. Some of them will do snapshots that verify at a VM level that they will boot um, and then give you that kind of thumbs up or okay, warm and fuzzy feeling. Other times there's solutions out there where you have to manually do a boot from the backup to make sure that it can be restored. That needs to be done done on a pretty frequent basis. Um, it's going to come down to your RPO and RTO models that you define for your organization. But you would be shocked at how many companies and customers I talk to that have a backup solution in place. And you ask them, well, how many times have you tested that? And the answer is never. They've had that backup solution in place for months, if not years, and never once um, checked to see if they could boot from that solution. So they could have a, a string of corrupted backups um, or it wasn't configured correctly, and it's just not recoverable data, but they've never tested it, so they can't verify that. The, the time you do not want to be testing your backup solution for the first time is when you did get hit by ransomware and you it's a 50-50 shot if it's going to boot or not. Um, in a disaster recovery solution, they're a little bit more robust. And so any true disaster recovery solution will usually have a playbook where they're do, they'll be doing two disaster recovery to make sure you can fail over and the organization is recoverable from a resource standpoint at least twice a year. I've seen that with some of our implementations where disaster recovery was actually used, not even as a, uh, the failover was actually a, a means of, of very quickly mirroring one environment to another mm -hmm. and then transferring it for purposes of deployments and such. That seems like a neat use of a, of existing tool set, kind of a repurposing it for another, another use. Absolutely. Now I've got another one here. Um, any considerations that, that vary based on whether your, your core system is on-premise or in the cloud? So if your, if your core system is on-premise, um, like you said, in, in my world, the most ideal solution is going to be having an on-prem backup because it's the fastest recovery. So say a user deletes a file or you need something back quickly, you can recover that quickly. Um, you always, always want to have two physical location backups. If you are deployed in the cloud, that same premise is 100% accurate. Um, you need to make sure that your backups or disaster recovery is not being built at the same site. Um, most organizations that offer those cloud solutions will have that created, but you want to verify if I'm doing backups, you're not just backing this up to an alternate cluster in the data center. It physically needs to exit that building um, and enter another building for it to truly be a backup or disaster recovery solution that I would be comfortable with deploying for our customers. No, that's good. That actually rolls into another question I got here. Um, for customers with limited internet connectivity, 
what do you normally recommend for on-site backups and how do you manage air gapping? So with customers that have internet or, or limited internet availability, um, I recommend doing a, a, a network attached storage device. So usually there's Synologies, there's a ton of different brands out there, um, but it's going to be locally sitting on your network. So it's not sitting on the same server infra infrastructure. These are, uh, that way, if you have a, a CPU fail or a hard drive fail, you still have a backup of that data. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to recover as quickly. It depends on the hardware you have. If you have another solution stack that you can restore that backup mm -hmm. to. Um, generally, you would take your uh, your hourly or your four hour snapshots and then back that up to that server. You would then do a one time daily replication, and that's going to be a if you're if you're not a 24 by seven operation, that's your best bet. Is it can basically do a trickle backup for your daily snapshot over the course of the evening. Doesn't impact bandwidth keeps that low when users aren't on site um, but generally you still want to try to get that uh, off site it, um, it, it, a lot of backup solutions you don't have to have robust bandwidth um, they're configured so if your internet drops out the backup's still going to kick back on as soon as your internet comes back on it's just a matter of it might take longer to move that data um, and that's why you would probably only look at moving a, a daily snapshot off site and then everything else would stay on site for your either hourly or your incremental backups. Mm -hmm. So that network appliance, Chris, is that just storage or does that, cause that serve as an operating system in the event of an outage? Depends on what solution you want to deploy. There mm -hmm. are network attached storage devices such as Synologies, which are really a, it's like a storage array. Um, so it's just a bunch of blinky hard drives um, and it's really just storing the data. You have other solutions out there um, that are, those wouldn't really be considered backup solutions. You're starting to bridge into that hybrid, more of a, a DRAS solution. And those can be um, on-prem backup. So you can back up to the box, but it also has the resources to basically, they'll size it to your organization's footprint. So you can spin up a local environment um, off of that backup disaster recovery device. Okay, nice. So that, that actually is good because another question that just came in, using Synology, do you trust the C2 cloud? No. Um, I The C2 cloud, I, I don't like to put my data specifically for the same kind of vendor or in that subset. Um, usually, if I'm backing up to a Synology, um, I will be replicating it to somewhere else. Um, one of the things that I've seen pretty positive is a lot of times people do a backup solution to one cloud, disaster recovery to another. So they're not putting all of their eggs in one basket. If you, if you can truly do a backup solution, um, whether it's public or private cloud, and they have multiple options. So they might not, you wouldn't be backing up to a single data center location, but if it's a private cloud, they have multiple data centers, you can basically retain your information in, in a backup to go to one data center, DRAS goes to another data center. That's generally my best practice. You can do that in cloud environments as long as you're not you're making sure you're not located in the same geographical area. Very good. Now, Chris, we have a kind of a blend of customers because we do infrastructure as a service and platform as a service mm -hmm. and a number of tiers in between. I'm assuming we're, we're running into cases where we have customers who handle back of a disaster recovery completely uh, oblivious to us and other, other customers mm -hmm. who look to us to do that. What's the mix that you're seeing right now of customers who handle it themselves versus offload it to a third party? Sure. Um, larger organizations seem to have a better footprint or, or a budget or a team that can kind of manage those. Um, I would say that as security threats have come up and that conversations become more relevant, um, the costs have come way, way down. So a lot of smaller to mid-sized organizations can actually afford these solutions. Now, I would have said 60 years ago, it was a very, very expensive option to do DRAS. Um, the new DRAS model, um, especially how we deploy it for most customers, is um, you're not paying for a one-to-one -one environment. Our DRAS solution in our private cloud is you're basically paying for the backup storage. So it's much more attuned to a backup price but it has a DRAS capability that basically as fast as you can boot servers is how fast your environment's gonna come up. So you don't have to pay for, say you've got a uh, four core and 16 gigs of RAM in a true disaster recovery solution, you have to have those resources able to be spun up in a specific time. That's where your recovery time objective comes from. In most disaster recovery solutions or older disaster recovery solutions, you're, you'd have to mirror that environment to have it be a hot environment. 
Um, in our case, it's considered a warm environment. So it's not truly hot to where the resources are sitting on, but they're sitting in clustered stacks. So your cost comes way down, but your recovery time objective speed is about the exact same. So it makes it a much more affordable for that mid-market to small enterprise um, kind of footprint. Nice. You had me thinking Abraham Lincoln there for a second, four, <laughs> four and seven gigs ago. Um, so to our, our audience, um, so as you see, we're, we're fielding some questions already. So if you have questions, uh, go ahead and uh, put those in the chat here. So we're just kind of talking through this. Now, um, I was never a great database administrator. I do remember toasting a few of them over, over, over the years. Um, so obviously when, when you're working in database administration, you have uh, your own set of backups that are occurring of a given database. Um, do these solutions preclude that? Do you continue doing your normal database backups in this kind of context here? What do you see customers doing there? Um, I think that it, it's it's a it's a wide variety. It depends on specifically on the customer. Um, I know specifically with like SQL and database backups, environments can be configured very differently. Um, if you are doing uh, basically you're doing live database replication where you might have three SQL databases that are all linked together that are doing mirroring, um, it's very different than running a single. Um, so if, if SQL has some of those features where you don't have to have a super robust solution if you're at the enterprise level because you're already deploying it in a mirroring kind of status. You still want to back up the overall SQL um, structure, but it's going to change like your actual snapshots and how often you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about backups, but we always talk about them in a uh, server standpoint. What do you see customers doing most often for user terminal or client backups? <laughs> so it, it, it can be done. Um, I would say that most company policies that I see out there are we don't save anything to the desktop, right? Everything gets saved to the server. That seems to be the, the common theme. Um, as we all know, unless that's monitored, managed, and actually kind of implemented and part of the company culture, it's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, mm -hmm. the, most users are going to locally save things to their desktop just because that's how users operate. Um, in that case, you can definitely do um, backups of desktops, but I would say it's not deployed very often. I mean, it is cost prohibitive. Um, you now have things like OneDrive, um, so that way uh, people's entire computer is also going to be cloud replicated. That's a, a way that I've seen a lot of users get around doing a traditional desktop backup. Um, mm -hmm. But most companies more look at doing it on the, at the server level versus doing the individual desktops. If you're an Active Directory domain um, environment, usually most data is going to be saved in a central location. If you're in a work group environment, you 100% should be backing up your desktops because that's where everyone's saving their information. Right, right. Yeah, I think Office 365 and OneDrive dried up that market pretty significantly. They did. All right, so here's another question. Uh, desktops and docs syncing to the OneDrive business, then tenant backed up to a different cloud vendor space, question mark. Yes. Um, so we re highly recommend that um, we actually deploy solutions. A lot of people think, well, it's a SaaS based solution or it's Microsoft. So my OneDrive is backing up. It's backing up, obviously, to the Microsoft cloud. Um, so then I should be good. Um, what most people don't do when they actually sign up for those is they don't read the very specific um, terms and conditions of how long Microsoft retains that data for. Mm -hmm. So you'll have a backup. But it's a matter of what is that threshold that Microsoft does. I know specifically for Office 365, I believe as well as OneDrive, it is a 30-day window. Anything mm. outside of that 30-day window, they will help you recover your data at a very expensive cost. Um, so we deploy solutions that can do OneDrive backup, Office 365, SharePoint, as well as Teams. Um, so there are options to where you're now basically using that OneDrive replication, um, and then you're making sure that you back that up to a separate location. Um, so it is very common in the space that after OneDrive kind of ate up and gobbled up that market, um, that now people are doing backups of that to make sure that you're, that's not a single point of failure for your organization. Right, a snapshot of a snapshot. Basically. I like that. Okay, so um, that said, we're running out of time here a bit. Chris, any other trends that you've seen in the, in the industry? Now, we, we, of course, we service uh, manufacturers and distributors. We've seen a lot of uh, differences between the two communities in terms of uh, hardware expectations, software expectations, price point expectations. 
Mm -hmm. Do you see any, any trends there emerging in those two markets that might be different from each other? Um, so it, it costs have come down. Um, the two trends that I think a lot of people are looking at right now is there is backups and then there's also archival backups. Um, probably don't have time to cover that all in this call, but an archive backup is blob, cold storage. Um, there's a lot of different public clouds out there that will deploy that to where you're retaining information for seven years so you can check off compliance. Um, that's, those options are very, very cheap, but they end up costing over time. Um, backup disaster recovery in, in the modern day of what people are deploying today, costs have come way down to where it's much more affordable. The biggest trend that I'm seeing currently with, with the just the marketplace and everything that's going on in the world is people are very worried about where their data is residing. Um, if people are worried about that, my biggest recommendation is find a data center um, and you can find public clouds that can cover this as well, that is ITAR compliant. If they are ITAR compliant, that data has to reside in the US and is not allowed to leave from a backup or disaster recovery standpoint. Then you don't have to jump through all the hoops of, you know, is my, what data center, what area is my backup sitting in? Um, as long as it is in an ITAR compliant cloud, whether it's public or private, it has to remain US bound. So that's my biggest recommendation. And what I see in the marketplace is a lot of people have concerns of, well, how do I know my backup um, or my providers not just backing it up to where it's convenient for them or where's the most cost effective um, is if they are in a solution set like that, your data will be here in the US. Nice. Uh, one more question that came in. Uh, Teams chat is not available for backup, correct? I believe that Teams are. are you I believe... I believe, I know for a fact Teams files um, are backed up. I do not know about the individual chats. Um, I think that might have to do more with a technical setting. Um, I know that you can, I think you can snapshot and archive team chats, um, That, but that gets into the security policy. That's probably going to be more of a, our managed services and VP of technology question that could answer that better. I know you can back up the files. Um, I don't know if you can back up the individual chats. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, any more questions that come in, we'll hit them before we call it a day. Um, other than that, just wanted to let you know that, uh, so I'm Brad Feeks and my information's here and uh, Chris Cockler from our team, he's there as well. If you have questions about uh, backup and disaster recovery, you are more than welcome to uh, be part of that conversation, reach out to us, and we'd, we'd love to talk to you more about that. And we will be having another session uh, next week, same time, uh, same channel. This time we will be talking about the cloud options that are available for your ERP system. We'll be covering kind of more of a cloud-focused uh, discussion there about how uh, infrastructure as a service varies from software as a service and how those uh, benefits and liabilities can affect your business. So I wanted to thank you all again for attending, and we will talk to you again.